it was the beginning of this new wave of American television. Television in the 20th century was the most repressed conservative medium in existence. The Sopranos is finally our first sense of what human television can look like. It changed on an artistic level, what you could try and what people would accept. David Chase and Gandolfini and company weren't trying to be liked. It was pretty amazing to see it take place. It's like a roller coaster ride. I mean, it was like a huge, huge roller coaster ride. The Sopranos was a feature idea that I had about a mobster in therapy with a very difficult mother. It's gonna be a, like a mob comedy. <laughs> then, maybe two years later, I went to Brillstein Gray. I had a deal over there. They said to me they wanted to do a drama series that kind of pushed the envelope. As I recall, it's, it's been some time now, but as I recall, David's contract was about to end and really nothing had come out of it. But at the end of the deal, question was asked, which was, is there some notion of doing a Godfather-esque type series? I said, no. There's already been a Godfather. Wasn't it? And I was driving home and I remembered that idea that I had about the mobster in therapy. And I realized also right at that moment that it would be, oddly enough, a really good kind of family show. It could be a mob show, but also a family show. And there would be really good roles for women. And that then turned into what was the beginnings of, of The Sopranos. We shot the pilot in 1997. It didn't go on the air until 1999. My judgment was that it came out really well. I think David's judgment was that nobody would be interested and nobody would even want to see it. Jimmy, may rest in peace, felt the exact same way. I remember seeing the ads for The Sopranos starting to pop up on bus shelters and things like that. And first thing I thought was, well, that's a terrible title. Like, that's, that show's just gonna be dead on arrival because that's just a terrible title. You all right? <laughs> My body's broken, the oh, bones coming see. through. Let me see, let me see. Ah, I give you a fucking bone, you brick! Where's my fucking money? We really broke some new ground, I think, in terms of what kind of storytelling was gonna be popular on TV, you know? What kind of latitude people were willing to accept from characters. No, what are you money. doing? Get over here! That's $3,000 here! $3,000 here! $3,000! Go ahead! The Sopranos pilot episode is so exquisite. I remember seeing it thinking, this is unlike anything I have ever seen on television before. It seemed to breathe in a way that television did not. It didn't have that kind of rushed feeling or that kind of feeling where everything had to be wrapped up. In that first episode, James Gandolfini just pops out. I'd seen him before in movies, but I had no idea he was capable of what he did at the very beginning. And Nancy Marchant and Edie Falco, they were all great from the start. Him with those ducks. The whole pilot was about the ducks and what do the ducks mean. At one point, these ducks land in his swimming pool and like John the Baptist, he descends down the steps of the pool, fully dressed in his uh, robe to feed these ducks. You know, anytime you're working with wild animals, you want to train them, but I don't know how well ducks actually get trained. The ducks kind of like hearken to something that's going on inside Tony that he can't put his finger on. And then the ducks leave. They were having fun in the pool and they wouldn't fly. They wouldn't fly on cue. So then we brought a couple more people in. We made a little bit more noise. We tried to get the ducks to fly. It took, took quite a bit to get the ducks to fly. 
and then he has some kind of a breakdown panic attack while Puccini is playing La Rondine in the background, which is about the flying swallows. I mean, the level, the density of this is, uh, is mind-blowing. Oh my God! Tony! Get in! Ah! Get back! Oh, no, no, no. Daddy! Dad! Look, Daddy Jr., cold. call 911. What's the situation on the ground today, right now, in the mall? Confusion. Instability. Vacuum at the top. What caused the decline? Your sister's ass. Television in the 20th century was the most repressed conservative medium in existence. The party's over. The Sopranos ushered in the 21st century. 1999 was a perfect time for the Sopranos to come on the air because it changed radically the very nature of television. Today, everybody's a bad guy on television. That's what television is. We forget that that was not the way things were. I'm not sure if I'd be correct in saying this, but it seems like it's the first show that really deals with an anti-hero and posits that person front and center. You watch another kind of drama, and there's a villain, and there's your hero, and you want them to win. And here, you want them both to win? Anthony Soprano, we have a warrant to search your house, property, and your family vehicle. Nobody understood the artistry, really, on the network side at that point, about having a very flawed character that the audience would come to love. One of the things we see is the big waves that The Soprano sends out into the culture, normalizing and making fully acceptable the idea of telling stories about bad characters. Are you in the Mafia? Am I into what? Whatever you want to call it, organized crime. I think that for my favorite show that I did was the one with College. It's called College. It's with uh, my daughter, Meadow. I'm in a waste management business. Everybody immediately assumes you're mobbed up. It's a stereotype, and it's offensive. And you're the last person I would want to perpetuate it. Fine. There is no mafia. It was exactly what the show's about, the two separate worlds you know, and how they collide. Come on, get in. OK, OK, what's the rush? Jeez, Dad. What's going on? I think I saw an old friend, that's all. He's trying to lie to her and say, everything's fine, everything's fine. And he's got to run off and find him and try to kill him and then go back to his daughter. That was a bone of contention at first with, with HBO. They were a little worried. It's like. You're gonna lose the audience. They're gonna get behind him in the first episode and see this guy loyal to his crew and, you know, a family guy, and then he's gonna kill someone, everyone's gonna hate him. David was like, no. The guy was a rat who put people in jail, so there's kind of a justification, and he's payback. And we have to be true to who this man really is. Good morning, rat. I really thought that, you know, as he was choking him, that he would somehow have a change of heart and let the guy live. You took an oath, and you broke it. That's what I think I've been conditioned to believe when you see something on TV. <laughs> it was truly shocking. He's committing cold-blooded murder in a way that you're not supposed to root for him. <laughs> At that moment, I didn't know what to feel about this guy. Because it was like, oh my god, he really did it. Where have you been? Well, I went back to the motel. They didn't have the watch, so I went over to the restaurant. The restaurant had your watch? Yeah, I took it off in the bathroom when I was washing my hands. Well, that whole thing, I was just reading it. It was like, this is wild. He's you know, lying to his daughter. He's, he's got to go see his daughter five minutes after he killed someone. He's taking his daughter to look at colleges. What more American event is there? And every time there was something that felt in that way, like it was the most American thing, he kind of poked at it so we could see the rot just under the surface. Miss Soprano, come on in. That was a real breakthrough that, 
oh, they're going to do things differently, and they're allowed to do things, and they're encouraged to do things that uh, you've never seen before. There they are. Hey, Ma, Uncle June. You're using mesquite. That makes the sausage taste peculiar. Livia was my mother. Playing bingo, Livia? Oh, not tonight, honey. You know, she's a degenerate gambler. My mother's just out there. She was always good for a laugh, I have to say that. I mean, as Livia, so <laughs> as Livia Soprano proved. Who's there? It's me, Ma. Who are you? This lady thinks she knows everything, and uh, at the same time, she is terrified of her own shadow. You know, somebody called here last night after Jock. Oh. You think I'd answer? It was Jock out. I was always brought up very well, manners, food. I was always well taken care of. She just wasn't the great, she wasn't the most loving, you know. She was more worried than she was loving. Come on, get dressed. I'm taking you to brunch. What? What? You heard me get dressed. What's wrong? Tell me. She concentrated on what might go wrong than what might have been going right. Why does something have to be wrong? Is it Meadow? She eats like a bird. She was funny. My, all, my, all my aunts and uncles and my cousins uh, always found her uh, extremely amusing. Mama Livia, you go must die, darling. Listen to him without my darling. I am nobody's darling. This one here, she never disappoints you, I tell you that. Are you still seeing your other women, Lorenzo? <coughs> Come on, Ma. She is a riot. I was wor working with her two minutes. I don't know if you can put this in, but she was there, and she forgot a line. She turns around, and she goes, what the fuck is the line? <laughs> and I knew it would be fine. What? What the yes, fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to. She's tough. I like that. You know, someday, somebody's going to wash out your mouth with soap on it. Oh, yeah? Oh, you? The mother was, uh, she's a train wreck. And you can see where, why Tony's so screwed up. You gave a fucking cousin Cartier dinner rings and you give me a vibrating chair? They're talking about the anti-leading man, you got the anti-mother. I can think of her line readings. Still, you know, the poor you. Oh, poor you! The way that James Gandolfini and Nancy Marchand would act with one another, where else do you see that on television? Mother-son friction like this. I, I gave my life to my children. He has so many ideas, David Chase, and so many details that he sees that I said to him one day, David, that note would require me to read a 400-page book before I could really use it. And we laughed. But he's not like your normal, regular person. David is charming and thoughtful and off the wall. People told me that my mother was funny, so I did that. But it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to write the David Chase story. I would have written the David Chase story. It wasn't that. But it was my view of the world, I guess. David uh, sort of became one of the first TV showrunners that became a celebrity on his own, with people realizing, oh, God, this is the guy, this is the brain behind this thing. He is the organizing imagination and authority behind uh, the entire enterprise. He wanted to make it as authentic as possible. He really wanted to be in New Jersey, and he really wanted Italian-American actors, and he wanted to find them, and he wanted to cast them, and it's all the little things. You know, one thing won't ruin the show, but when you add them all up together, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't have the right texture. David wasn't afraid to say, you know what, that moment could be a little better. He was always right. We lived in the editing room with these things. He lived and breathed it. He's somebody for whom music was key. One of the major achievements that that show had is the completely original way in which music was used on it. Thinking about every frame of that show, every frame of every episode of every scene, that specificity is what made it as good as it is. Commendator! Bonjour. Cut circus. He's not satisfied with the current leadership. Must have me popped. Oh, mother. F 
motherfucker. He's got to go. I want to think about it. What is he to think about? Don't beat yourself up about this. I'll take this guy apart from the joints with him conscious. Cut off his piece of deal and feed it to him. All due respect, D. He's a fucking corpse. Nobody's killing anybody. The popularity of The Sopranos, I think, surprised everyone. David Chase is a significant American artist. The Sopranos is the beginning of American television as a serious artistic enterprise. Sunday night is the most competitive night of television, and for HBO to come in and take it uh, was pretty monumental. Something very important was happening. If you listened carefully, you could hear cracks in the world as we had once known it. When they talk about water cooler shows, this was not a water cooler show, this was the night of. People start asking me to borrow episodes and they knew I had them. And my then girlfriend would like have parties and invite friends over and it, it suddenly, it made me a lot more attractive in her eyes. I was just so excited to see a show on TV that I could watch each week and follow these characters and be surprised by them. When I saw how many hundreds and thousands of people in the street waiting to get into the premiere. You knew that these people were real. I was standing on the stage of Radio City when I was going, whoa, this is unbelievable, this is a dream. How could that not change you? How could that not be, you not feel tremendously lucky? face, okay? <laughs> Let's face it, he was a cold-blooded murderer. He murdered people. What is it? Do I look like a pussy to you? <laughs> Most of the time, it was stuff that we found funny. Oh. Uncle Junior falling down the steps. That made us laugh out loud all the time. You could find yourself horrified and laughing simultaneously and being disturbed at yourself for having that kind of reaction. Fucking poison ivy all over. I can feel it itching me already. <laughs> He's a 146 Rudine Kinderhook. The joke on the show is you never want to get a phone call from David. I got the phone call. It was on a Sunday. It really hurt. I mean, I don't take it personally, but it just hurt knowing that I wasn't going to be around anymore because I really fell in love with it. My favorite part was calling my mother just to warn her that I was gonna be killed in that night's episode. And she was like, oh, why are they doing that? And who, and who's doing it? And I said, it's Tony, it's Tony. She says, your cousin, your cousin, no! She was really upset that it was gonna to be Tony. After the show, I called her and I said, how was it, are you okay? And she says, oh, Steven, what a beautiful death. She says, and you look so handsome. I mean, she's watched me die and get beat up so many times. <laughs> How's that for a mother's love? It says in these movie writing books that every character has an arc. Like everybody starts out somewhere and they do something, or something gets done to them, changes their life. That's called their arc. Where's my arc? The writing is everything, as it always is. David always had this ability to write pieces that was every man's experience. You know, Quasimodo predicted all this. 
Who did what? All these problems, the Middle East, the end of the world. Nostradamus. Quasimodo's the hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh, right. Nostradamus. Nostradamus and Notre Dame. It's two different things completely. And so it's just a, such good writing. I mean, you'd be laughing, and then five minutes later, there's a violent scene. It was it's very much like real life. It was very, you never knew what to expect. If you're going to tell a story about New Jersey mob people, you can't have them using language that's acceptable for uh, 8 o'clock on The Cosby Show. Your uncle has acquired a taste for her. Uncle June gives head. World class. I mean, I don't know how to put this, but one of the episodes about Dominic, he loves to, uh, you know, go down on women. Uncle June's in a muff. What? I'm reading this thing going, we can't do this. And we did it. The fundamental question is, will I be as effective as a boss like my dad was? And I will be, even more so, but until I am, it's going to be hard to verify that I think I'll be more effective. It's the language. We want Johnny Sack. I want to fuck Angie Dickinson, see who gets lucky first. Even for people who didn't grow up in an Italian-American universe, they recognize the at-homeness in it of these people. Oh, let it yeah. 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 Some time for lunch. Yeah, set a plate. You got it. The dialogue meant something. You ever go to tie your shoes and you notice the end of your laces are wet? You go to public bathrooms, you stand at the urinal. Oh, fuck, come on, will you? He's asking me, I'm telling him. The more you see the episodes, the more you see what it's telling you about the world that they live in. You want to commit suicide? Tie your shoes and have a bite of Brajol. <laughs> it's too hard. It's a joke. Come on. The first thing David told me was stop writing jokes. If you just depict these people honestly, the humor will be there, and you need to trust that. The guy you're looking for is an ex-commando. He killed 16 Chechen rebels single-handed. Get the fuck out of here. He was with the Interior Ministry. Guy's some kind of Russian Green Beret. Oh? Huh? Oh, you there? I... Fuck! You're not gonna believe this. He killed 16 Czechoslovakians. Guy was an interior decorator. This house looked like shit. Pine Barrens was the 11th episode of season three. Maybe been sort of flirting with the idea of doing a story about Russian gangsters. So Valerie, you got Silvio's money? Fucking Silvio. Watch it, comrade. And I just thought it'd be interesting if they took a Russian out into the woods to deal with him, and then he got away. How far is it to Atlantic City? Ah! Oh! Oh! I said, Timmy, that's great. Go, go pitch it to David. And then I went in there, and I pitched it to him, and he goes, that's great. Let's do it. Steve Buscemi was going to direct his first episode for us, and it was going to be whatever episode 11 turned out to be. And just coincidentally, it happened to be Pine Barrens. When I read that script, I, you know, I just remember laughing out loud. What's that? Nathan's bag. Fuck, there's some ketchups and shit. Give me some. Terry wrote brilliant script, and I probably get way too much credit for it. I remember at the end of reading it going, wow, I better not fuck this up. Those guys did all the work. I was just happy to be a part of the folklore. Not bad. Mix it with the relish. What I think even made it extra special was all the snow. It was written to be shot in the wintertime, but without snow on the ground. Four years in the army, kid. We just follow our own footprints. Come on. When we were scouting, there was no snow. And this was right before the Christmas break. And we said to each other, all right, well, as long as it doesn't snow, we'll be fine. Of course, on that break, we got dumped on. It amped up the tension and the circumstances for our characters by a thousand percent. Suddenly, everything looked the same. There's no way to tell where you were going. We were driving south, and the sun's setting there. What good's that to us? At least we know what direction we're headed. Yeah, but we're still fucking lost. And then they end up all night in a place that, that you know, it's like, it's like being on the moon for them. Give me your shoes. I can go get help. Fuck you. You're not leaving me here. And what's your fucking plan? Eat catch your packs? We should have stopped at Roy Rogers. And I should have fucked the Elevens, but I didn't. It was just a really, really fun shoot and turned out to be an episode that people really responded to. When somebody asked me if 
a place is clean, I'll say it's so clean you can eat maple walnut ice cream from the toilets. Eh, there's exceptions. That's what Polly Walnut says when somebody asks him if a place is clean. <laughs> His mother uh, keeps saying, you're not going to send me to a nursing home. And he keeps repeating, it's not a nursing home. Green Grove is a retirement community. The show's so quotable because it's not trying to be quotable. So what, no fucking ZD now? Hey! hey. I'm not a cat. I don't shit in a box. There's no fucking honor. Forget your enemies. You can't even depend on your friends. You've got these big philosophical questions being worked through by people who are not articulate. You know what they say? Revenge is like serving cold cuts. I think it's revenge is a dish best served cold. So what I say? You have people talking in very, very casual, dismissive terms about all kinds of criminality. We take them in the woods, dig a hole, and the store. Fuck that, I gotta eat something. And then you have them getting incredibly heated in discussions about stuff that's totally trivial. I heard they fired the produce guy. Enough! I'm so sick and tired of hearing you people talk about food, food, food. That's all anybody ever talks about is prosciutto, cheese, and fucking fava beans. I'm, I'm drowning here. I also love the swearing. Fuck you. Toodle fucking ooh. What the fuck was that? Anthony is a cunt here away from owning all of Northern Jersey. And I am that cunt here. The language on you. You blow your father with that mouth? I love that cocksucker like a brother. And he fucked me in the ass. There's a poetry and a color and character distinctions in the character's various profanity. I stick motherfucking provolone in my socks at night so they smell like your sister's crotch in the morning. Federal marshals are so far up my ass I can taste brill cream. That's rich stuff. And that's not the dullness of prosaic swearing. That's the inspired poetry of profanity. Fuck you, Santa! Hey! <laughs> Another thing that was great about this show, starting with James Gandolfini, is they looked like real people. Tony Soprano was believable from the first time we saw him on the screen, and so were all the other characters. It had an enormous cast. The acting was really, really solid and believable. I think it's time for you to start to seriously consider salads. What do you mean? Well, I think people love Tony Soprano because he's not fronting. You know, like, he is who he is. There's always such honesty and such vulnerability, even when he's being angry. Where is she? Where the fuck is she? Where is she? Please don't. His big asset as an actor was his sensitivity. Don't make me do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Right. He could really somehow show you his soul. I think that was a quality that he personally had. I don't think it's something that you can act, although he really was a great actor. He was just using this natural sort of warmth that he had and infusing it into this character, this often monstrous character, and that was what people were responding to when they responded to Tony. There's a Zuni saying, for every 20 wrongs a child does, ignore 19. There's an old Italian saying, you fuck up once, you lose two teeth. I think people took great pleasure in thinking that, oh my God, even a guy like Tony Soprano has the same basic feelings about the world as I do. As a parent today, you are over a barrel no matter what you do. Let's just not overplay our hand, because if she finds out we're powerless, we're fucked. At the end of the day, he was a father, you know? And a relatable with the things I relate to with my own children. So if I'm not killing people on the side and, and um, you know, a gangster. Jimmy just gave everything he had. And I think on set, everybody just wanted to rise to his level. Then I come in, that's no good. Instead of staying here for the whole thing, it feels weird. I acted with him more than I've, I've acted with any actor, and probably more than I ever will act with any actor. You don't love me anymore? Well, that breaks my heart. But it's too fucking bad. It was like a freight train coming at you, in a good way. You don't have to love me, but you will respect me. No matter how intense he had to get, or how dark he had to get, or angry, it was still about, yeah, oh, he's got to give 110%.
What's the one thing every woman, your mother, your wife, your daughter have in common? They all break my balls. You can't have a great show unless you have strong, complex, female characters. The fuck was that for? I'll write you up a list. The dynamics between Tony and Carmela felt really, really true in a way that a more quote-unquote realistic domestic drama would feel. I think my favorite scenes were always the ones between James and Edie Falco because they really learned to play off each other. That's chemistry that is really, really difficult to fake, which is trust. That's just trust. My favorite episode is Whitecaps. Carmela! What the fuck are you doing? Fucking shitbag! I just felt the level of acting in that episode was unparalleled. I'm not leaving here, Carmela. I don't love you anymore. I don't want you. You are not sleeping in my bed, Tony. The thought of it now makes me sick. Watching Jim and Edie go at it, you, you couldn't believe you were watching actors. I mean, the, you swore you were watching this really happen in front of you, and it was, it was just magic. You were just in the midst of somebody's very, very, very private, personal life and they were exposed in a way I had never really seen. The last year I have been dreaming and fantasizing and in love with Furio. <laughs> what? Every morning when he'd come to pick you up I would look forward to it all night long in bed next to you. Those nights when you were actually in the bed. I was afraid for both of them you know as characters uh, just brilliantly done. He talked to you all, poor you. He made me feel like I mattered. The writing and the acting in that episode was just, just still knocks me out. Honestly, if you told me five years ago I would be sitting here today. <laughs> Sometimes you forget Carmela and Dr. Melfi are these twin pillars of the show along with Tony. Did Anthony share with you any of our insights about his last panic attack? The Gabagool and my mother when I was a little kid. Right, yes. The therapy scenes between Tony and Dr. Melfi were really very accurate, insightful explorations of what it means to be in therapy on a level that we had never seen on TV before. Getting into the headspace of a mobster, that's unique. And I think the device of him in therapy is brilliant. And I think people love that. The episode where Dr. Melfi gets raped, that was a big one. That was a really, really major one. Well, you're not using the cane anymore. Dr. Melfi is sitting in the office with Tony. She hasn't gotten justice from the legal system. And she feels intuitively that if she tells Tony what happened, he will kill that man. And we feel it with her. You actually want Dr. Melfi to go to Tony so that her rapist can be killed by Tony. I mean, you, you want to say something? And she doesn't do it. No. She would not avail herself of Tony's power to get vengeance for what had happened to her. That was what a moral person she was. But that's not saying. There's not a certain satisfaction in knowing that I could have that asshole squashed like a bug if I wanted. The moral anchor of the show was always Dr. Melfi. She was always there to sort of put everyone else's behavior in context. And she has one of my favorite moments in the show where she tells Tony, How many more people have to die for your personal growth? And that's the show in a nutshell. That is no small achievement to have presented a world like this of brutal criminals whose safety you yearn for. We're all sinners at heart. And if our sentiments and emotions can be twisted, we will end up sympathizing with an evil character. So The Sopranos is built on that assumption that in order to be moral creatures, we have to be able to detach ourselves from evil that appears likable. It was a show about moral complicity in a lot of ways, and that was what made it so intriguing, and it was front and center. They kept pushing their behavior in more extreme directions as the show went on. Like, it was almost as if they were trying to, to dare the audience to continue to like Tony. 
And we always liked Tony. Hello? Yeah, it's me. Look, everything's okay. It's Christopher. He tried to commit suicide. Oh, my God. Is he all right? You know, he's been drinking, so he's probably fighting that heroin urge again. Anyway, Sil's on his way. Okay. Adriana's fantasy that she has when she's in the car, you think is real, that, you know, maybe she got away. And you realize it was just kind of a fleeting moment in her mind when, in fact, she's in the car with Silvio. I'd stop to eat, but I don't want to get to the hospital after Tony. I'm not hungry. The two of them just played it so wonderfully. The whole time he's knowing what he's going to do, and she intuitively just knows it. Why are you crying? He's going to be fine. Just the look on her face, I found just so moving. Come on. No, no, come on. Please. Silvio turns on her and drags her out of the car. They didn't show that death, but it's still horrifying. It truly was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. It just knocks you out. I still get goosebumps thinking about that uh, ending. I got calls from friends and relatives saying, what the hell happened in the end of The Sopranos? It just, it just stopped. And I had to tell them that was the end of The Sopranos. <laughs> Ambiguous endings are profoundly threatening to us because they imply that there are no answers in the universe. I was so fascinated by the outrage because when I looked at it, I thought, have you people been watching what he's been doing? Oh, I went ahead and ordered some for the table. Some people wanted quote unquote closure. They wanted to see him get shot and go, you know, face down in the onion rings. They wanted the TV show that was made before The Sopranos was made was the problem. And I didn't, I wanted The Sopranos, so I was, I was thrilled with the way he ended it. I found the ambiguity of the ending consistent with the whole enterprise of a disturbing moral dilemma as a reminder that our fight against evil never ends. I think it's great that people debate what the meaning of the ending is. But what upset me was the idea that this had just been done to like just go like that. Why would I ever do that? People, you know, you've been entertaining them for six years and, I, and now you say, fuck you. Exactly. Why would I do that? I don't get it. I just don't get it. Artistically, the way The Sopranos ended is exactly the way it should have ended. He came up with the one ending that nobody can ever do again unless they're doing it as homage or parody. There is no explanation. There's no pointing the viewer. You either get it or you don't get it. She goes, Dad, all these girls are gonna meet up at the Piazza Navana. I said, guess what? You'll be meeting people at the road feet. <laughs> Honestly, when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to be thinking about the episodes you shot. You're going to be thinking about your friends, loved ones, and the ex human experiences. Very good. This was very satisfying. 
Good, how are you? Coming back to work with uh, I thought, you know, could you put me in the background or something? You know, I think you can give no, me like a mustache. Or a wig or... <laughs> For my money, I don't, I don't think I'll ever experience another show the way I experienced that show. Working on that show was like walking down the street and hanging out on the corner with your friends. It was like that every day. <laughs> I think that's why we didn't kill each other, first of all, working 16 hours a day. I think these people actually like each other and everything gels. At least I hope that's there. I didn't watch the damn thing, so I don't know, but. <laughs> the purpose of fiction is to hold up a mirror where we can look at ourselves and thereby better understand ourselves. We're soldiers, you know. Soldiers don't go to hell. It was a show that continued to want to make us ask questions. That's the best legacy I can ascribe to The Sopranos. We're not even engaged yet. And when you're married, you'll understand the importance of fresh produce. It's the constant effort to present humans at every turn. That is the difference. We are a family. And even in this fucked up day and age, that means something. I've always thought that you could take all the mobster stuff out and you would still be left with the greatest story ever told on television. <laughs> it's like poetry. It's alive. It is alive. You cannot wear it out. What The Sopranos brought was to respect the audience's ability to handle something complex. <laughs> For the first time, you had people saying, well, this is way better than a movie. Our true enemy has yet to reveal himself. If I'm a fisherman, I'm going where the fish are. <laughs> I feel like the fish are in long form TV right now. You know, I've been working with the government, right, Tom? Suddenly it became more like what literature is, where they have the freedom to take you into a hellhole and then you come out of it, but you can't wait for the next chapter. They broke the rules on what could constitute a leading man and made it okay for the shows after that to go further. You can be terribly flawed, and people will tune in week after week after week. I have been watching several of the new adult complex dramas, and none of them has matched The Sopranos in the poetic power of the language. I find I have to be the sad clown, laughing on the outside, crying on the inside or in the detailed composition of each individual scene and shot. You and my dad, you two ran North Jersey. We did? Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's nice. It'll be one of those things, like a novel by Dostoevsky, like a play by Shakespeare, like a symphony by Beethoven, that will be able to consume over and over and over again. All I want is you. That's all I have ever wanted. It's kind of like Haley's Comet. Like, it, you can't conjure it in TV terms. It is the Beatles, and it is 2001. There's everything before, and there's everything after. The Sopranos started a revolution that is more profound than anything else that has ever happened on television with the exception of the invention of television itself. To the people I love, nothing else matters. The farther I get away from it, it's like, I can't believe it ever happened. It was so, so satisfying creatively and so much fun. That was a rocket ride, like being shot into space and seeing the world from some other angle. What a trip. Hey, here we go, guys. Oh! Yeah. 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 Yeah.